All right. Again, thank you everyone for being here tonight. My name is Julie Rupsom. I am the Deputy Director with Niches Land Trust, and we're so excited to have Dan Childs be here with us tonight. Um, Dan and I actually met, oh gosh, 25 decades something, ago, <laughs> something years ago <laughs> when I was an undergrad and he was a grad student in the Botany and Plant Pathology Department at Purdue. Um, so Dan received his master's from the Botany and Plant Pathology Department at Purdue in 1987. Um, and he has worked in both academia and industry as a weed scientist and agronomist for over 36 years. He is a wildflower enthusiast and is an author of two wildflower identification field guides, uh, Back Roads and Into the Woods. All right, and with that, I'm gonna invite Dan to go ahead and begin. All right, can you hear me first of all? Can you hear me? I can hear you, and I'm gonna type in the chat box asking if everyone else can hear you too. Okay. All right. I, I'm getting a lot of guesses and we can hear you. Okay, very good. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, this is exciting. Um, get to do this uh, through a different, uh, different way than face to face, but you know, that's, that's where we're at right now. Um, so the title here is Woodland Wildflower Virtual Tour. And we're gonna look at uh, wildflowers in the woods uh, that bloom from June through September. And with that, I will advance to the next screen if my computer will allow that. Okay, it was working earlier. Oh, here we go. Okay. Julie, you can see it that. It is right? working. It is working, okay. yes. All right, so a few disclaimers before we get going here. Um, so I will be talking about a, a limited number of uh, woodland wildflowers. Obviously we don't have time or don't, don't even if, know if it's possible to go through all of them. Uh, so I'm going to cover about 30 in this presentation. So if you don't see your favorite uh, wildflower in this presentation, you can make a comment in the chat and we can bring that up and talk about it at the end. Photos taken in natural light. Uh, certainly uh, since we're in the, in the woods, it's going to be shady. So the light is going to be limiting. Um, but I didn't, I took all these photos and I didn't really want to use any artificial light because that would make it look, well, artificial. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, capture the plant in its natural lighting. Uh, so sometimes I had to kind of wait for the sun to peek through the leaves and, and hope for a good shot. And, uh, and then I'd also play around with the aperture and the, and the speed and the ISO settings on the camera to try to get the, uh, a better shot. So it's, it's always a little, uh, uh, you know, challenging to take pictures uh, in shade, as you know. Um, I'm not a professional photographer. I, that will be obvious when you see these, uh, but I am a very persistent amateur. <laughs> so uh, I'll take multiple shots of these. Um, alternate names. So I'll be using common names here in this presentation. Uh, and you may know these plants by a different common name or even their scientific names. And that's, that's all great. Um, but um, there is a, uh, I do have a solution for this uh, dilemma and I'll, uh, I'll reveal what that is here at the end of our presentation tonight. In order by when they flower. So this presentation is going to follow uh, June through September. So I'm going to start with plants that flower in late May, early June and finish with those that flower, you know, not until the end of summer, really. Terms, uh, I'll be talking about a few terms, uh, some botanical terms, uh, namely the stamens, which is the male part of the flower. The anthers produces the pollen. Uh, oftentimes the anthers in these flowers are, are brightly colored to attract the uh, pollinators. Uh, style and stigma, those are parts of the uh, female flower. And so I'll be talking about uh, those as well. Watch out for ticks. Well, the out outdoor kind. Uh, Hopefully you won't get a tick while you're watching this presentation. Uh, if you do, we're doing something terribly wrong, Julie. So we'll have to. <laughs> um, so um, we're, let's get ready. So let's lace up your shoes and uh, let's go for a walk in the woods. All right. Okay. So stop. <clears throat> Don't go any further. Uh, before we go forward, we really need to turn around and look back and see what the woods looked like a couple of months ago. 
So this is what the woods would look like in early April. Uh, you notice there's no leaves on the trees yet. It's pretty bare. Uh, the ground is starting to soak up the sunshine and it's starting to warm up. So we're starting to see a little bit of green activity. And soon you will start to see a lots of spring ephemerals. So uh, ephemerals is the term meaning uh, short lived or short life cycle. So these flowers, they come up early in the spring before the leaves come out because they want to be able to flower, pollinate, uh, and, and, and re, you know, complete their life cycle before they get shaded out by, their, by the trees. Um, so we have wildflowers like bloodroot, um, Virginia bluebells, various trilliums, and of course the iconic spring beauty with the uh, pink anthers there. So um, there is just a whole bunch of these spring ephemerals that uh, have already bloomed. And, and I could give a whole presentation just on those. But looking at my watch, it is June the 3rd. So we'll say goodbye to those spring ephemerals and let's march forward. So the uh, presentation is gonna be laid out this way. We've got a split screen. Um, you can see that, Julie, just shake your head, yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> We have fire pink on the left and great water leaf on the, on the right. So this is how it's gonna be organized going forward here. So fire pink is a member of the pink family. Um, it has opposite leaves and um, the, uh, when I say opposite leaves, it means there's two leaves per node. Uh, very bright uh, red uh, petals. This is a very unique plant. There's not much that's really red in the, in the uh, woods at this time, uh, but you will notice they have a notch at the tip here, okay? So that's characteristic of, of fire pink. And, and most of the pinks, most of the plants in the pink family, uh, that includes the catch flies, are sticky. They have little sticky hairs uh, on the stems, on the leaves, and on the flowers. And this, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, I'm pointing at the calyx. This is the uh, little structure here behind the flower. Uh, this is where the ovaries are, are made and, uh, and the seeds eventually. And this is also sticky as, as well. So one uh, close relative of fire pink is royal catchfly. And royal catchfly, also a brilliant red, um, doesn't have the notched tip. So that's one way you can kind of identify those. The other way is that royal catchfly doesn't bloom now. You'll see it blooming later in the summer and it typically likes more open areas. So you'll see that in a more of a prairie ecosystem and fire pink is more, more in the woods. Okay, let's go to a great water leaf. Uh, this is in the water leaf family. Uh, the stems are about two feet tall and hairy and a uh, little out of focus here because I was actually focusing on the flowers, but the leaves at the bottom here are really big and they, and they resemble a maple leaf or, or an oak leaf. And then the flowers are this really nice uh, bluish lavender, uh, five petaled. Uh, the stamens, you can see those dark stamens there. And one thing unique about the water leaves, and there's two or three, four of those that are common in this area, is that you can identify them by uh, their style. And so I'm gonna get a close up look at this. This is the flower and the style I'll be pointing at with my cursor here. Julie, can you see the cursor? on your screen. Okay, so you notice that the style, again, this is the female part, is split part way down. Okay, here's another one, a little bit out of focus there. Uh, on some water leaves, this split goes all the way almost to the, to the uh, down to the center of the flower. So that's one other way you can identify uh, the water leaves. So forest phacelia has a style that's split almost to the base of the, uh, of the style. You know, I lost my cursor. But great water leaf uh, has a split near the top. Okay, next plant is spiderwort. Um, spiderwort is in the day flower family, so um, they will they will flower, uh, you know, and then um, and then you only see one, you know, it only lasts one day. And uh, beautiful flower, uh, three petaled, uh, this uh, kind of bluish violet, the uh, stamens are feathery and they're tipped with these bright, conspicuous yellow stamens here. Um, there are a number of different uh, spider warts, some that uh, are that 
typically live in the woods. Uh, this is Virginia spiderwort. You'll find that in the shade. It's not a very tall species, uh, but there is a spiderwort called Ohio spiderwort. And you'll see that mostly in the prairies, in the prairie type ecosystems. And, and uh, right now at Prophetstown State Park, uh, you, will, you will see those that are in flower now. And they're, they're fairly tall. They're taller than the, this particular spiderwort. Uh, my wife doesn't like this particular plant because it has both the words spider and wart in its name. <laughs> so, oh, Julie's laughing there. I can't hear her, but I see her laughing. All right, moving on. Uh, anise root. Okay, so anise root is a member of the carrot family. Now, you may recall or know of a plant called wild carrot, also called Queen Anne's lace. So there we go. We got. We got two different alternate names there for the same plant. But you notice this flower, this inflorescence, sort of resembles wild carrot. Okay, so it's a collection of little tiny white flowers in an, in an umbel inflorescence. Anise root has uh, compound leaves. You can see the leaves here, um, uh, various uh, leaflets. Uh, it's hairy. And um, the, uh, the striking thing about um, anise root is that the roots and foliage of this plant emit a licorice fragrance. Uh, now this species or this, uh, this plant is very close uh, relative to uh, sweet thistle. So they are very similar in appearance, just slightly different. There is a close up of the flower. You can see the little tiny white flowers and uh, the styles and, and stamens sticking out there. All right, Jack in the pulpit. Okay, this is a plant that's found in the woods, uh, very common in, uh, in quality woods. It's in the arum family. Uh, this other members of the arum family include uh, green dragon and skunk cabbage. And they're unique because they have these structures, uh, one's called a spathe. And for Jack in the pulpit, the spathe would be the pulpit. This would be the, this sheath thing right here. It's kind of striped with uh, light green and maroon. And then the spadix is the flowering structure and that's right here. That's Jack. Okay, so you see Jack sticking out of the, uh, the sheath there, the uh, spathe. And the spadix is a long cylindrical flower and so that kind of goes down into the, uh, into the sheath there. And it's covered by little, little tiny flowers. And then eventually the flowers turn into a fruit and that's what you see on the right side of the screen here is that in late summer the flowers turn into these bright red berries that are easy to find in, in the woods when you're walking through. So when you see this little uh, little stick with red berries on it you'll know that it came from Jack in a Pulpit. All right next uh, flower is the downy wood mint. Uh, it's in the mint family. As all mints they have opposite leaves and square stems. And uh, the individual flowers, uh, or the flowers are in a cluster, excuse me, in a cluster uh, at the top of the plant. And with mints, they have uh, two petals. There is a upper lip, or excuse me, two lips to the, to the uh, flower, an upper lip and a lower lip, okay? And this lower lip then is dotted with uh, little maroon dots and this is to attract pollinators. So this is a nice little landing pad then for, uh, for a pollinator. It looks like there might be even one here uh, down below here, a little fly. Uh, but once that uh, bee or, or, or um, fly lands there on that uh, little uh, lip, uh, if you look right above that lip, there is the stamen and the stamen then has, this, has the anthers covered with pollen. So that pollinator is gonna get pollen uh, rubbed on its back when it comes in for some uh, for a nectar treat. So sneaky little plants, right? That's how they get. The, that's how they pollinate. Uh, how they move the pollen is to get those uh, insect pollinators to come visit their flower. Okay, on the right is squaw root. All right, and so they kind of look like uh, pine cones if you're walking through the woods. But one thing that's that's striking about squaw root is it doesn't have any green color, okay? This plant doesn't photosynthesize. So how does it get its nutrients? Well, it's actually a parasite. It gets its nutrients from 
the roots of an oak tree. Okay, so very specific. So this is a non-photosynthesizing parasitic plant. And if you see a clump of squaw root, look up because you're probably standing under a mighty oak tree. Okay, so pretty cool little plant. Okay, next. Wild black raspberry, and I'll talk about the common blackberry on the right at the same time, or both of these. These are in the rose family. They're brambles. They have thorns. Uh, if you're walking the trail in shorts and you wander off the trail, they will find you. Uh, this has happened to me a few times. Uh, but yeah, you'll, you'll know when you get into a patch of them. You can find these in the woods, they're in thickets. Uh, you can even find them growing in the open. So they're pretty versatile where they grow. The wild black raspberry has very small flowers, uh, five white petals here. And the fruit is a fruit that's made up of droplets. So all these little individual uh, blue things is a droplet. And so that's what that fruit looks like. Now on the common blackberry, the, let me take that fruit off for a second. You notice the common blackberry flower is much larger than the wild black raspberry. And the petals are kind of wavy and the stamens, you can see the stamens here, they're kind of dark. So uh, you, can, you can tell a difference by just looking at the flower. But the other thing you can look at is also the fruit. So on common blackberry, the fruits are typically larger and the droplets are larger. And then the most uh, characteristic identifier is how you pull the berry off the plant. So if you pull the berry off wild black raspberry, there's a little, uh, a little feature called a receptacle, and that receptacle kind of holds the berry on the plant. When you pull the berry off, that receptacle will stay on the plant. It won't be on the berry, okay? If you see that, if that happens, then you have wild black raspberry. If you pull the berry off and the receptacle comes with the berry, then you have common blackberry. Okay, so that's how you distinguish the, the two. And both of them are delicious. I, I love blackberry cobbler, it's one of my favorites. All right, Solomon seal and false Solomon seal. So Solomon seal, very common in woods. Um, first thing you'll notice is its leaves. So it's got some really large uh, alternate leaves, uh, ovate in shape, and they clasp the stem. And then underneath the stem then is where the flowers are, it's kind of hanging down, kind of like a, uh, like a lamp here. And uh, they will, uh, this is the flower, so it's not real showy but they will produce a little green berry that then uh, turns blue eventually uh, as, as the summer progresses. Now, false Solomon seal, uh, if you're just looking at the foliage, looks much like Solomon seal. The only difference is that the flower is then attached to the end of the stem, and it's this uh, inflorescence here and these little white star-like flower clusters is what you see. So, so the flowers are quite a bit different than the Solomon seal. And in the summer, late summer, those flowers then will turn into uh, red berries. Okay, so it'd be easy then to find those in late summer. All right. Next is uh, very, very unique plants. And, and what I did here is actually I'm showcasing their fruit uh, rather than their flower because it's the fruit that's conspicuous. So imagine walking into the woods and you see this. Um, the eyes have wood, or the woods have eyes, okay? They're like they're staring back at you. But uh, this is the fruit of doll's eyes. It's in the buttercup family. It has um, uh, compound leaves. And, but again, it's the fruit that's conspicuous. I mean, here you got this white berry, got a black uh, center, looks like an eye of a doll and in contrast on this bright pink flowering structure here. Um, so it does have a flower and the flower looks like this, uh, blooming now in June. And then eventually then it will, it will form those, uh, those unique berries. So the flower is, you know, again, kind of inconspicuous. You may miss it as you're walking through the woods, but, uh, but you're not gonna miss that. You're not gonna miss the, uh, the doll eye berries there. 
On the other right hand screen, we have early horse gentian or gentian. Uh, this is from the honeysuckle family. And just like doll's eyes, I wanted to showcase the fruit because it's the fruit that's uh, conspicuous. That's what you're going to see when you're walking through the woods. And the fruit, you're not going to see that until till late summer. Uh, these are fairly large plants, you know, three feet tall or so. They've got large leaves that are opposite. And you notice that the berries, uh, are, are formed right there in the axles of the leaves. Uh, the flowers are very inconspicuous. It's gonna, you know, you'll have to look hard to find them. But again, they're in the axles of the leaves. Uh, they are kind of uh, tubular in shape and they're maroon in color. And you see this little stick here and a knob at the end. So this is the stigma. This is the, the female part of the flower. So, uh, so again, flowers, axles of the leaves which uh, later turn into little red berries that kind of remind me of like little tomatoes. I, I don't know if they're, they're edible. I know Nick's on the program so maybe Nick can chat in if uh, these are edible or not. Okay moving on we have eastern red columbine also from the buttercup family. Um, I have a couple of these in my perennial garden. They have just pretty much now finished flowering. So maybe it's a little early for them this year. Uh, but uh, the leaves are compound, multiple leaflets, uh, <clears throat> but it's the flower that attracts everyone's attention. So you have this beautiful red, looks like a chandelier. Uh, this is actually a combination of both petals and sepals. So even the sepals are red as well. And then hanging below that then is a cluster of bright yellow stamens and, and anthers here. So a very unique, very pretty plant. Um, as I mentioned, I have it in my perennial garden just, just for that reason. Common black snake root. Okay, so this is a, a plant that's also in the uh, carrot family. Um, it has uh, palmately compound leaves. So palmate means it uh, kind of looks like the uh, fingers on your hand where leaves come out from a central point. Um, they, you, you're going to walk right by this plant because it's not that conspicuous. What is conspicuous is that it just takes over the entire area. I mean, you could just see a huge colony of these uh, in, in several woods right now. Uh, the stems are kind of shiny. You kind of see that right here. It's uh, kind of reflecting the uh, sunlight. Uh, but the flower itself is, is, is pretty small and again, not very conspicuous. Uh, it's kind of a yellowish green and you can see some of the uh, stamens there uh, uh, in the anthers uh, kind of giving that, that yellow look to it. So common black snake root. Okay, next is a tall anemone, uh, another buttercup, okay. And uh, so we got compound leaves again. And uh, this time we have five, and these aren't petals, these are actually sepals, okay? So colored sepals here uh, surrounding the center. And when the sepals um, finally drop off, you are left with this seed head, which resembles a thimble, okay? So another name for this is thimbleweed. So for the young folks on the line, uh, do you know what a thimble is? <laughs> Ask your grandmother, She'll, she can tell you what a, what a thimble is and what it's used for. All right, Christmas fern, all right? So not a flowering plant, right? It's, uh, it actually produces spores. Uh, it has glossy, glossy fronds, uh, very, very, uh, uh, lots, of, lots of leaflets, 20 to 40 leaflets here on a frond. Uh, the, the spores are actually produced underneath the fronds near the tip of the leaves. Um, but uh, I just, you know, I threw it in there because it's part of the woods. Uh, it's beautiful and it gets its name because it stays green all through the uh, Christmas uh, time of year. All right, leaf cup. Leaf cup is in the daisy family. Um, pretty large uh, plant, about four feet tall. It's hairy, very large leaves. Uh, they resemble uh, oak leaves. Uh, and they're kind of downy soft. And, uh, and then it has a really small, small uh, flower, which is kind of odd for the large of a plant that is, large leaves, but it has a little small flower. Um, 
the green things behind the flower are called bracts, okay? Uh, it's called a bract. And then we have the ray petals, these white ray petals. So this is, this is like a daisy flower. And then it's surrounding a yellow center, or the disc flowers. So this is a, like a little daisy, okay? But again, it's a pretty small flower for the size of the plant. And then we have Michigan lily. Okay, one of my one of my favorites because it is so unique. Um, oddly enough, it's from the lily family. Uh, you know, it doesn't look like a lily, uh, like a lot of lilies, because it has very unique leaves. I mean, we got a uh, it's a rosette of multiple leaf leaves here at each node, and then we have these flowering stalks, and then at the end of the flowering stalks is this just beautiful flower. Um, it's actually uh, made up of both petals and sepals called a tepal. So these are called tepals and they recurve backwards to show the underside of them. And as you see these blotches, these maroon blotches here. So the whole thing is just beautiful. Imagine walking into a woods in July. It's, it's dark, it's, it's green, it's damp. And then you run into something as, you know, wow, just, just, it takes your breath away when you see the, 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 the colors here. Underneath the uh, tepals then we have what's dangling down here are the uh, anthers. So uh, these brown anthers here. And then if you look closely, you can see the style and the stigma all there in that flower. Michigan lily is pretty, uh, is pretty rare. You don't, you don't find those too often, and around here anyway. Okay, American germander. Uh, American germander is in the mint family. Almost looks like spearmint, doesn't it, the leaves. Um, but again, like mint, it has a two-lipped flower. And the lower lip here is kind of the landing pad. It's got kind of sprinkled with a, a few little pink dots. And uh, as the uh, insect comes in, then it's going to, they're going to, uh, it's going to get rubbed on by the, uh, by the stamens that are above, above the uh, landing pad. Um, American germander typically grows in colonies, so you, you, don't, you won't just see one plant, you'll see several. And they typically like wet soil. You'll, you'll find them growing near a stream, uh, maybe in a ditch or something of that sort, but they, they kind of like wet soil. Okay, starry campion. Starry campion is in the pink family, so a relative of fire pink. Uh, the leaves are in a rosette around the stem, so we have four leaflets per node here. Um, and um, the flower is a, a bright white um, flower with uh, deeply divided petals at the, that's born at the top of the stems. And this plant will tolerate uh, some pretty dense shade. Now, I was lucky to to catch one here just with some sun shining through the uh, the trees here but um, so the flowers sort of appear like stars in a night sky when you when you see this plant uh, in the woods everything's dark except these bright white flowers so it's pretty unique american bellflower american bellflower is in the bellflower family uh, leaves are alternate with tooth margins um, the showy blue violet flowers are, are five lobed uh, and they're flat. So they're not uh, bell shaped, uh, but they're flat. And the other characteristic that's unique is that the style is, um, is curved. So we have a three part style that's kind of curved backwards here. Okay, so you can see this uh, coming off the middle of the, of the flower. Okay, woods bunch flower on the right is uh, again, oddly enough, in the lily family. Um, deep, deep uh, woods here. Um, very, very low light uh, available for this shot. You notice the flowers are, again, these are tepals and they're maroon in color. And while I was taking this shot, uh, flies were, were attracted to this. So this is a uh, pollinated by flies. I guess they're attracted to that, that maroon color. Um, but one thing that you will find first in the woods is this. So woods bunch flower comes from a basal, a uh, rosette of basal leaves. And so you, so you won't see that flowering stalk every year. This, this plant's kind of an every other year 
uh, type of plant from a flowering standpoint. So you just may see this one year and then the next year uh, you see the flowering stalk and then, you know, and then it flowers. So, uh, so it's kind of a unique plant. All right, jewelweed. Jewelweed's uh, in the impatiens family, the touch me not family, it's an annual. Um, has these trumpet shaped flowers that are uh, made up of um, uh, sepals and they're dotted in orange and you know they're, they're attractive to the pollinators. Um, the, uh, there is a yellow jewel weed that is also prevalent in this, in this area, just a slightly different species. And um, so the, some of the resources say that the plant juice has been known to treat poison ivy rash. So I've never tried that, uh, but if you get poison ivy, you might want, and you got a jewel weed next next to that, or out in the woods, you might want to try that and let us know if it works or not. Okay, sweet Joe pie weed. So this is my favorite. I don't know why. It's just it's just so unique. Um, I love the the big uh, inflorescent panicum here. It almost looks like a big uh, cotton candy. Uh, sweet Joe pie weed is one that that blooms uh, in open woods, typically in the shade again. It's got whorled leaves arrangement, about three or four leaves per node. Uh, now there's another species called spotted joe pie weed, which looks similar, although the panicum is a little more flat on the top and a deeper pink color, and it likes water. You'll find the spotted joe pie weed uh, near a stream or, or a swamp or someplace where it's wet. Then there's a third uh, species called hollow joe pie weed, and it's huge. I mean, it thing's a giant. It's like nine feet or taller. Uh, the head, the, the, the flowering head looks like a sweet joe pie weed, but it is a much bigger plant and it has a hollow stem. Great blue lobelia. Now, this is in the bellflower family. It's actually a, a relative of cardinal flower. It also has two lips and uh, the bottom lip is segmented into three parts here. Uh, beautiful flower, you can see the flowers are stuck to the main stem. Um, and I blow up one of the, uh, uh, the flowers here, you can see Mr. Bumblebee uh, with his head down into the flower going after his nectar prize, and in doing so, picks up a lot of pollen. You can see the pollen sack there on his leg, and so a uh, good way to spread the pollen around. Uh, blue lobelia typically is, you know, again, we find that in the shade, but it likes water as well. So you, we tend to find it near a water source. White snake root. Okay, so this is one of the latest flowering plants uh, in the woods. So now we're getting, we're talking about, uh, you know, September time frame, mid-September, and uh, summer's coming to an end, and these are the last, last uh, plants to flower. Uh, white snake root is in the uh, daisy family. You can see the little um, puffy white flowers here. These are actually the disc flowers. It doesn't have any ray, ray petals. These are just the disc flowers. And uh, another characteristic of white snake root is that it is poisonous to cattle. So uh, I have known uh, in my experience that some farmers have lost uh, livestock uh, because they are grazing uh, some old uh, woods that happen to have quite a bit of white snake root in it. All right. The last uh, two here we'll talk about is kind of out of order. So, uh, but I just want to leave the orchids to the last uh, beautiful plants. Not only are they beautiful, but they also are rare and endangered. So we need to protect them. And Niches is doing a wonderful job of doing that. Uh, the large yellow lady slippers, they actually bloom in May and uh, early June. And uh, they are very unique in that they have three petals and the uh, lower petal then is made into, or is in the shape of a slipper or a moccasin. And then the other two petals and the sepals then are uh, twisted and long and are kind of striped with uh, maroon striping here. So very unique plant, again, endangered. Um, uh, the niches stewards are doing a great job of propagating this plant. It was, you know, just a few plants a few years ago, and now they, I think they have over 30 clumps, and so they're doing a great job of propagating that through uh, hand pollination. Then we have orange fringed orchid. Uh, you find this uh, in the open oak woods, um, blooms in July, 
It has these uh, very unique uh, fringed petals here, um, very attractive. Imagine walking into a dark uh, woods, nothing but green, and you see these bright orange sticks. <laughs> so a uh, couple of really unique plants. They are endangered, and uh, the niches are doing a wonderful job of bringing these back uh, to, uh, to the ecosystem where they are, uh, hopefully they'll become uh, prominent in the near future. One of the problems with these is, well, their predator, uh, the main predator is deer. And so they are using uh, screens, uh, fencing to help uh, keep the deer out uh, from munching these down. Okay. So as we wrap up here, um, I always get the question, well, where do you like to walk? Uh, there are lots of different properties that niches uh, uh, has and supports uh, through their um, uh, through their organization. Um, I think Julie said there's over 40 properties now. Uh, most of them have trails that you can walk and enjoy nature. Um, they're doing a wonderful job of, of bringing these back to the original ecosystem, incorporating uh, uh, plants that uh, grow in that ecosystem and then you know, and, and pulling out or getting rid of the invasives. Uh, Moyer Gold Woods, if you live around here, this is between Lafayette and, and Monticello, just off of uh, State Road 39. Uh, it's a great woods. It's got a lot of spring ephemerals and uh, lots of other of these um, uh, summer type woodland wildflowers as well. Rock Creek Nature Reserve uh, over by West Lebanon. It's got a little creek running through it. Kind of reminds me of home. We had a woods with a creek running through it. Lots of diversity there. Uh, it has drooping trilliums. Uh, it has um, oh, I just just lots of other really cool plants and, and a great place to to get away for a while. Of course, uh, Clegg Memorial Garden. That's where the office of niches is. Uh, a lot of great trails. Uh, I don't know if how many people uh, walk the trails every week there, but I know it's a very popular place there, right there in Lafayette, and uh, just a ton of spring ephemerals uh, there as well and a lot of unique plants too that, uh, that you can find that you can't find other places. Uh, and then we have some city parks, county parks uh, that we're blessed to have in the area. Celery Bog has got, actually has three different ecosystems there. It's got a woods, it has wetlands, and it has a prairie. And so you can find all three different types of uh, plants in those ecosystems. Uh, Happy Hollow Park, again, lots of spring ephemerals there. Uh, Dutchman Bridges is just all over the place there in that park. And then Prophetstown State Park uh, nearby, we've got a nice state park there. It's mostly prairie, but there is a, a woods trail, trail two, that uh, kind of the eastern sloping uh, trail that faces uh, the sun in, in the mornings. And you can see lots of spring ephemerals. There's a big uh, colony of skunk cabbage there and some other, other unique things. Um, if you want more information about where some of these niches properties are, right there is the uh, website. And you go there and you can look up uh, the properties. They give you the directions. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, some place to try something, you know, new this, this weekend. Go, go find a new uh, property to walk. Lastly, um, all of the uh, photos that you saw here in this presentation are in this book called Into the Woods. Um, the, the, this book also has uh, alternate and common names and scientific names. Remember, we talked about that earlier on. This is your resource for that. Um, it lists all the different pollinators that are attracted to these uh, flowers, uh, has flowering dates, uh, status of the plant. In other words, are they a native, non-native, or invasive? Uh, there's uh, plant descriptions and then a botanical glossary with, with terms and a flower color index. If you find a flower and it's blue, not sure what it is, you can go to that page and it'll list all the blue flowers that are in the book and you can kind of uh, go through and you know, eliminate the ones that it isn't. So, uh, and the proceeds from the sale of this book go to help fund niches programs. So um, I think 